Hello, friends. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today to go over your spine and joint questions. This is the show Hi, where I'm we Dr. Brian uh, take Harris, your questions, I have an question. uh, usually submitted through YouTube or Facebook or social or through our new video submission service. We have our first one of those today. I'm really excited to, uh, to see how it works. This is our service where you can just record your question into your own cell phone and send it to us. So we can then go over it and answer you uh, live on Fridays or um, on the air. So very excited to see how this first one goes and to uh, kind of take it from there. Uh-oh, forgot to, forgot to silence my phone. I'll be back with you in just a second. All right, uh, ready to go. Let's, without further ado, let's dig in and because see what we got this week. We're gonna start with our video submission. So let's see, uh, I'm gonna play her question for you and uh, we'll probably pause it and answer as we go. Let's, let's see how it goes. And Oh, hold on, guys. Sorry, um, we've got a we've got a little technical going on here, which I'm gonna get fixed. There we go. There, and let me put in my earphone so I can hear her and see what's going on. I on a message and told you what was wrong with it, and I sent you a copy of it. And I was told that they won't do surgery until I quit smoking, but I'm scared to death. I'm going to be paralyzed. I've already got permanent nerve damage. All right, let's start and unpack these things one by one. Um, so she was told that she couldn't have spine surgery unless she quit smoking. And that's a really common thing that for a surgeon to do or say, and the reason is, Smoking reduces your probability of having a fusion. Remember, the surgeon does fixation. They put in hardware to lock a joint in one fixed location, and they go in and rough up the edges of that joint so that your body thinks it's no longer a joint, it's a fracture. And then your body is going to want to heal that fracture like it would any other fracture. Well, as it turns out, and it's probably because when you smoke, you lower your oxygenation in your blood over time by getting smoke into your lungs. But it's a fact that smoking reduces the chances of your body healing a fusion properly. So a lot of surgeons would say, hey, smoking's not required, it's optional. So surgery, if the surgery is optional, why don't you quit smoking? That way you're gonna give yourself the best chance of having a good fusion. That um, is one of those things that, well, I, I think it's a good idea, to be honest with you. You never, you know, you're the customer as the, as the patient, and you don't want people telling you what to do. You're going to them for help, not for, to make, have them make you do things you don't wanna do. But as the patient, as the customer, you also have responsibilities. You wanna do the best you can, and all they're doing is trying to help you get better. So, I get it that it may rub you the wrong way. I think she's talking also, a lot of people smoke to reduce their anxiety. And she says in the next word, I'm just scared to death that I'm gonna die during surgery. You're not, you're more likely to die on the way to the surgery in the car than you are in the surgery itself. I mean, think about it, you're surrounded, you have an anesthesiologist and a surgeon, you're in, and a nurse, you're in one of the safest environments in the world, in the operating room. So it is true they're doing things to your body, but it's, it's also true that you need to have that done or you wouldn't be there 
and you've got the best team possible around you to help take care of you. So nothing easier said than done, right? Surgeries obviously makes everyone nervous, but if you kind of back it up and take responsibility for your own reaction, I think you could see you could get to kind of a different place. Let's see what she says next. Uh, from the surgery before, C5 and 6, and they're also going to be C4 and 5. And I've got foraminal, this and that. And I don't C4 and 5 control your breathing. If they mess up one time, can't I be on a ventilator for the rest? Okay. So obviously very anxious, and I understand. But let's kind of go through where these ideas come from and what their reality is. So as I understand the situation, she's had a prior C5-6 ACDF. It didn't fuse, probably because of the smoking, right? I mean, they almost 99% of ACDFs fuse. This one didn't, and my guess is that the surgeon is now saying, hey, you can't smoke, because now we gotta do C4-5 as well. The foramen is the hole that the nerve root comes out of in the spine, and when the disc collapses, that inherently makes the, the shrinks the hole. So one good thing that happens when you have ACDF surgery in your neck is it opens up the hole, the foramen, that the nerve root comes out of. That opening up the foramen is often the most important part of getting relief from the ACDF surgery. Remember, we've got cervical stenosis with radiculopathy, that cervical narrowing with nerve root pain. So opening up that foramen is one of the most important things that ACDF surgery does for you. She then talks about, well, doesn't C4-5 control your, um, your uh, breathing? And I don't wanna be on a ventilator for the rest of my life. That comes from the diaphragm. Our, our breathing happens because our diaphragm muscle contracts and as it goes down, our chest goes out and air comes in. Air is sucked into the lungs. That diaphragm muscle is what triggers and initiates all of that. Muscles are controlled by nerves. Nerves are sourced and have their control through the spinal cord, which connects to the brain. And the diaphragm as a muscle receives input from the nerves that come out at C3, 4, and 5. In fact, if you're trying to memorize that, like you were in medical school, what all the students learn is C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. The rhyme just makes it easier to remember. So she's saying, well, couldn't I be, par couldn't I be on a ventilator for life because my, C3, four, my C45 involves those nerves? And the answer is no. So the C345 nerves uh, on both sides would have to be damaged in order, all three, in order to paralyze your diaphragm on both sides and force you to be ventilated for the rest of your life. I've never even heard of that happening. Never even heard of that. Is it possible? Yeah, I mean, is it possible that I'll be hit by a meteor today when I'm here in this studio and that I won't be able to do this broadcast next Friday because I was struck by a meteor today? It's possible, but I'll tell you what, people, I'm going to plan on being here because the odds of being hit by a meteor are pretty small. Same thing. It's possible, but it's not going to happen. So we got enough in, to worry about here in reality. This is an example of something that I would call catastrophizing. She's taken possible risks and turning them into real catastrophes and letting that build the anxiety. And this is definitely something that anxiety really is good at. When we start out being anxious, our brain goes into this catastrophe mode. You know, it turns out our brains really, their, their function is to pre predict the near future and prepare our bodies for it. So we get into these anxiety spirals where the brain is predicting a future that is a catastrophe based on the information that we get, in this case, likely over the internet. Stop doing that. So stop and think, okay, do I know anybody who had ACDF and now has a paralyzed diaphragm and is on a ventilator? No, I've never even heard of that happening. 
if it did happen and I read that report, well, how many people had ACDF and how many ended up on a permanent ventilator? I'm going to go with that number is vanishingly small. If a risk is so small that I don't know anybody who had it, my doctor's never heard of it, they're not taking any precautions to, you know, there's no, it's just the risk is so small, the chances are so remote. You have to tell your brain, hey, that's not going to happen. That's not real. There are other things. I might have trouble swallowing. A third of people do have some difficulty swallowing for two to three weeks after ACDF surgery. Yeah, that's going to happen. If you want to think about things, think about, let that brain focus on things that are really going to happen. And if I have trouble swallowing, I'm going to need to have some pudding and some jello in my house. So before I have surgery, I better get that pudding and that jello and get prepared. I better have my meals set up so that I have the help that I need and I don't, I don't have to do anything. Those are the kind of healthy things that you need to be doing and not getting into these very understandable but very dysfunctional anxiety cycles. Don't, don't let your brain do that to you. It's not helpful. Let's see what else happens. And I had cervical myelopathy back then. As far cervical myelopathy. So we know, we understand now that she had ACDF surgery and that it didn't fuse. And I mean, honestly, that's almost certainly due to the smoking in this situation. So got to stop smoking. And then she had cervical myelopathy. M Y E L O P A T H Y myelopathy. I do want to take a second to talk about that because it is something that a lot of people experience, and it is a very important condition. We talk about a lot of, a very famous term is sciatica. Sciatica is a pain in the distribution of the sciatic nerve. We also talk about herniated discs causing sciatica. It's in the distribution of the sciatic nerve, but it's actually the nerve root. And nerve roots, when they're pinched by herniated discs, whether that's in the neck or in the low back, can be a really common and, and wickedly painful and important to know type of pain. There's something else though that's much less common and so we don't talk about it as much. And that is what if the problem is not the nerve, like the sciatic nerve, and it's not the nerve root, which is where the nerve roots come off of the spinal column to form the nerves, it's not that. It's farther in. It's coming from the spinal cord itself. Well, the spinal cord, if it's pinched, if it's having a problem, that's not called sciatica. That's not called radiculopathy. If your spinal cord is being affected, then that is called myelopathy. Myelo, M-Y-E-L-O, in Latin refers to the spinal cord itself, or maybe it's Greek. I don't know just a nice boy from Arizona. <laughs> so either way, it's, it's a spinal, myelopathy is a spinal cord problem. The symptoms of sciatica, a radiculopathy, a nerve root problem, are an electrical pain shooting down your leg. Radiculopathy in the neck is an electrical pain shooting down your arm, often here for C5-6 or here for C6-7 or here for C8. But myelopathy has different features. Myelopathy is characterized by clumsiness in the hands. So difficulty, it usually shows up as difficulty with writing, difficulty with fine motor movement. If your handwriting is changing, what the heck? Why, why, why would my hand, you know, I learned to write when I was in third grade, second, third grade. Why is that all of a sudden? Well, that can be myelopathy. Myelopathy is often characterized by clumsiness of gait, difficulty with balance. Myelopathy, spinal cord compression, is also characterized by having problems on both sides. Nerve roots are only on one side, but the spinal cord gives rise to fibers that go to both. So myelopathy is often about both sides, and that can be a symptom. Myelopathy, when it's in the neck, can affect the arms and the legs. Nerve roots only affect one or the other. It can't be both because it's, it's too far to the periphery. You see what I'm saying? So myelopathy is a different thing, 
Myelopathy can also give you trouble controlling your bowels or bladder, trouble with gait, clumsiness of the hands, pain that shoots down the arms with coughing or sneezing is not uncommon with that kind of a problem. It's called Lermite's phenomenon. So there's a lot, a lot to myelopathy. And the thing that's important about myelopathy is, one thing that's important about myelopathy is it's dangerous. Because if you're having myelopathy and it's not corrected, it may decompressing, the damage may be done. So even if you try to undo it and correct it, the myelopathy may not get better. It may just stop getting worse. So myelopathy is very scary. And symptoms of myelopathy are something that we want to investigate right away. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for bringing that up. And I sent you a um, picture. I sent you my MRI report. I'm scared to death. I heard. I know you're scared to death. Again, I just want to explain t again that your brain is caught in a catastrophic loop, and it's not realistic. ACDF is one of the most common surgeries in America. No surgery, all surgery makes us nervous, but when that nervous, when that normal nervousness tips over into becoming paralyzed and being unable to act one way or another and the ruminating thinking and the catastrophizing, that's when you know that we're not dealing with normal anxiety anymore. We're dealing with anxiety as a separate problem in and of itself. And when that happens, that's not something a spine surgeon can usually help you with. That's something more like a psychiatrist or a psychologist. That's getting into a mental health condition that might need help from another kind of a doctor to get better. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being our first video ask uh, uh, patient and customer and friend. And I'm so excited and uh, very grateful to you for doing that. I don't have any more video asks. I hope you guys send me some. But I don't have any more right now, so I'm going to take that earphone out and get on to the next question. Uh, this one is from Brian. Um, hi, I'm 64 years old and in good shape. Good for you. I love it. I'm 190 pounds and I exercise regularly. I'm jealous because that's actually my goal. My ideal body weight is 190 pounds and I don't weigh that. I have severe left leg sciatica for approximately th three years. Crap. That's terrible. Sciatica is not something that should be left alone and uh, shouldn't go on for more than days or weeks. I'll tell you why. You got to think of sciatica like a fire. The longer it burns, the bigger it gets and the harder it is to put out. So you really want to deal with sciatica and get rid of it. Three years is a long time. That also tells me that whatever's going on with you, it should have gotten better. So it's not just a herniated disc. Your sciatica must be due to some combination of a narrowed spinal canal or there's something else going on with you that is causing this. Um, but only the last three months or so. My back feels fine, so it's just sciatic nerve pain. The pain is from the top left hip, top of the left hip. Also, I have tingling and numbness at times. What type of surgery can I expect to have? MRI report states moderate to severe spinal canal stenosis at L3-4 and L4-5, as described above, significant nerve root compression, broad-based disc bulge, central left paracentral disc protrusion, and moderate uh, left protrusion. Uh, Brian. Hey, I could answer this question a lot better if I could see those MRI images, but I take it from this written report, Brian, that what we're dealing with is spinal stenosis due to a combination of a narrowed spinal canal as well as disc herniations, and that this is going on at two levels, the L3-4 level and the L4-5 level. Here's what you can expect. You've had symptoms for three years. You have ongoing nerve root damage in the form of sciatica. Your doctor needs to examine you and figure out which nerve root is leading to these symptoms. At the L3-4 level, the L3 nerve root and the L4 nerve root come into play. At the L4-5 level, the L4 nerve root and the L5 nerve root come into play. There's a redundancy there. So your surgeon or your doctor needs to make a determination on looking at the MRI and examining you, which nerve root they think is most likely causing your problem. 
Once that's determined, because you've had these symptoms for three years, you do need an operation, and that operation is laminectomy. Laminectomy is where the surgeon goes in and removes the lamina bone, which is the roof of the spinal canal, and then through the hole and the, uh, the opening that the surgeon makes in that bone, they can go through under the microscope and through a small tubular retractor and take out all of the herniated disc material and thickened ligament and anything else that is narrowing your spinal canal. And once all of that is complete, they can remove the retractor and you can heal up. Now you have two levels, but I would recommend they do the first level, decide which one is worst or which one is causing your symptoms, and then see if the second one needs to be done or if you can wait on it. So that's what you have to expect. Laminectomy is about a 45 minute to a one hour operation. It's done in an ambulatory surgery center as an outpatient. You do not need to be admitted into the hospital and be exposed to infection and COVID and all that stuff. Once your surgery is done, if you do light duty type of work, uh, clerical work or office work, you can go back to work the next week. If you do moderate duty work where you're on your feet a fair amount, you probably need two to three weeks. If you do heavy labor, if you do significant physical work, you need six weeks. If you do heavy labor, you need 12. Once you're fully recovered, you're fully recovered. You should not need a laminectomy again, and you can get back to it. The biggest risk of the operation is a CSF fistula. That's where they tear the watertight lining of the spinal canal. And if that happens, your surgeon needs to fix it during the surgery. There is a risk of infection, nerve root damage, et cetera, but these risks are small. This operation is common, and it's, it's really highly effective. So that's what's next for you. Oh, I got questions on the chat. Oh, I'm so psyched. Let's see what we got. Um, where are you? Hold on, people. I'm going to get it back up on YouTube. Yes. It's on the Microsoft Edge tab. There it is. There's YouTube. Okay, here we are. It is open. Oh, yeah. Remember when I was playing that video before? Sorry, guys. I, um, I killed my own broadcast. <laughs> Hang on, I'm getting there. I'll get to you. Um, nope, hold on. I'm getting there. Okay, I'm here. Uh, best practice, yes. Rapid fire Q&A, yes. I want to get on my own chat and see if I can see you see you guys and your questions. Sorry for making you wait. Just hang on there. I'll be right back. Hmm. Okay, um, PJ's working on it, you guys, but uh, hang on, let's see if we can, I'm not sure why this chat's not coming up. Oh, because I'm not in it. Here we go. Okay. All right, uh, Katie Girl asks, does myelopathy show up on an MRI? Yes, it does, Katie Girl. By the way, thanks so much. You've been so, uh, I've seen your comments and your questions on the channel. Thank you so much, Katie Girl, for being with us. I understand you're in Texas. So yeah, myelopathy does show up on the imaging, especially on MRI. The spinal cord has a normal signal, and when there's swelling inside of it, it shows up as swelling, and you can definitely see it on the MRI. The other good thing about myelopathy and an MRI is you can see what's causing the narrowing or what's causing the spinal cord compression as well. All right. Um, Brian C. from Virginia. Um, oh, that was the question. Okay, Brian C., that was your question. Got it. 
All right, Katie girl. Um, uh, Brian, see if I didn't mention I've had four epidurals. Um, I do want to comment on that. Uh, so epidural injection is not appropriate if you have myelopathy. The reason is myelopathy is usually caused by external outside compression. And that compression is, um, is, uh, is going to prevent the epidural fluid, the injection fluid, from circulating in your epidural space. So if you have myelopathy, you really should not be having epidural injections. If you went and saw a pain management doctor and you have a diagnosis of a myelopathy and epidural injections were recommended, I would really strongly recommend that you come on this show. That's the kind of thing we really should try to sort through and understand and make sure you're getting the right recommendations for you. Scroll up in the chat, there's a question from Leslie. Okay, got a question in the chat. Um, from I Like Jelly. The only way to diagnose cervical instability is with flexion and extension scan with movement or can it be diagnosed with static flexion and extension? Um, that's a great question, I Like Jelly. So flexion and extension x-rays are when they have you bend your neck down, x-ray, look up, x-ray. The images classically are actually static. You're just in a flexed or an extended position and what the doctor looks for on the x-ray is how the bones have moved. Whether the bones have moved abnormally, that would be called unstable. Sometimes a doctor can predict instability based on the damage to the normal structures. So for example, if you, have, if you were in an accident and you have an MRI and there's broken bones, as well as MRI evidence of damage to the ligaments, which normally strengthen and support and protect the spine, then it's too much risk to even do those flexion and extension x-rays. The, the surgeon can presume that you are unstable based on the amount of damage to your underlying tissues. So very, very important thing to realize and to know. Um, there are very rarely uh, flexion and extension movies which can be made. And what's done there is you, they put you in a fluoroscope and they have you bend your neck and tilt it up. And just like a movie projector is thousands of pictures being taken and played together, they can do the same thing. They can just go picture, 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 picture. But they essentially make a movie so that the doctor can see the dynamic movement. That kind of uh, movie though is very rarely available. I personally find those very helpful and very interesting information, but generally not necessary. Just the ret plane flexion and extension x-rays should be enough. By the way, I love your handle. I like jelly. Thank you for tuning in. I've seen your questions as well. Um, let's see, what else have we got? I think that's it for now. Well, we're gonna be watching the comments. If anything else comes in, um, I'll look forward to answering your questions in real time. Good questions. Uh, Isabel Burton uh, says, hello. Hi. Uh, around eight years ago, I injured my knee. I never bothered getting it checked, but what happened, when it happened, I heard a loud pop. It felt stiff. It was hard to bend for a bit and swollen and painful. It's not fully healed. When I start straightening my leg and my kneecap pops off to the outside, I was wondering if you believe this may be an ACL tear or something different. Um, if you've, the, so popping and locking and clicking of the knee are classic manifestations of meniscal tears. Remember, the meniscus is the cartilage pad that is between the leg bone and the thigh bone. So here's a model of the knee and from the front. Here's the kneecap. If we turn you around from the back, we see the thigh bone and the leg bone. And this guy, this cartil cartilaginous pad that the thigh bone rests on is a meniscus. And if I break this back, you can kind of see in there. There's two of them. You've got two. One here and one here. This one is on the outside and doctors call outside lateral. So that's the lateral meniscus. And this one's on the inside toward the middle. 
and doctors call that medial, so that's the medial meniscus. It's classic if you tear a meniscus in an injury to hear a pop, and then the meniscus is torn. So then every time you move your knee, you get popping, clicking, and sometimes locking. Locking happens because, see how when your knee moves, there's got to be this smooth movement of the cartilage of the thigh bone over the meniscus? Well, if there's a tear in there, your body senses it and your brain says, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not moving, lock. So it's not that the knee is physically locked, it's functionally locked because your brain won't move. So we've got a couple candidates for what's, your, what's causing your problem, Isabel. And the first candidate is that it's a meniscal tear. Now you also mentioned that you're getting popping of your kneecap. Well, here's the kneecap. A lot of people don't realize, but the kneecap is actually kind of a joint. See the blue? That's cartilage in this model. There's a joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. And the medical term, if you want to look this stuff up, the kneecap is called the patella, and the thigh bone is, is labeled the femur, and the space, the joint, is the patellofemoral syndrome, patellofemoral syndrome. This is the dreaded patellofemoral syndrome. I think it's a lot easier just to look at it like that, don't you? But anyway, that's patello, that could be patellofemoral syndrome. And you may get, when you move your knee, this is locked, and so there's movement of that thigh bone on that kneecap. And if there's something wrong in that space, that can also be a source of the popping that you hear. The anterior cruciate ligament is this guy. So now remember, we're looking from the back of the knee and the anterior cruciate ligament is this guy. And it starts there and then it goes up and inserts in the front of the knee. So see what it does? It prevents your knee from moving like that. See how when I try to move like that, that anterior cruciate ligament will let me go? That's what the anterior cruciate ligament does. That is not typically a cause of popping you can get a sense of locking if your knee is unstable, but you're eight years out with this. So I think it's unlikely that it's the ACL and more likely that it's the meniscus or that it's this patellofemoral space. Well, okay, that's what we think. How could you find out for sure? Well, there's two studies that are commonly used to investigate this situation. One is an X-ray and the other one is an MRI. And the x-ray is for showing bones. It's an x-ray, it goes through where it doesn't go through the bone, that's how you get the image. The MRI is for showing the soft tissues. The soft tissues are things like the meniscus and the anterior cruciate ligament. Now in your case, we don't think the bone is broken. We think it's this patellofemoral space or the meniscus. The best way to image that is gonna be an MRI of your knee. So the test that's really gonna show us what's going on is gonna be an MRI. Now, you may find it surprising then when I tell you, you still need an X-ray. <laughs> but the reason is, from a practical point of view, your surgeon is gonna to need to, any surgeon or any doctor, sports medicine doctor, is gonna to need to know if you have arthritis or not, and if you do have arthritis, how much arthritis you actually have. So you're gonna have, and the best way to tell that is a snapshot with an x-ray. So x-ray and MRI would be the next step in imaging to help understand what's going on with you, Isabel, and to help you figure out what happens next. By the way, the only reason to get those studies, it wasn't clear to me from your comment whether you're currently in pain, if your knee is popping but it's not painful, then there's no point in getting this imaging most likely because you're not going to do anything. If you're not in pain, you're not, there's nothing that you can prevent or unlikely anything that you can do. So it's not gonna change your life and since it's not gonna change your treatment, there's really then not a good indication to get the test. So uh, long answer to a short question, but I hope that, I hope that covers it for you, Isabel. 
Next question from Anthony P. Hello, Anthony P. Hi there. I have a herniated disc in my L5-S1. Okay, sorry. Those are painful. It started many years ago and the pain was immobilizing. I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand, and I couldn't sit. I could barely lay down. It was terrible. Yeah, it sounds terrible. I'm sorry that happened to you, big guy. Four months later, all the pain went away. Yes! So uh, before we get on with Anthony P's question, I just want to point out something. Not four minutes later, not four hours later, not even four weeks later, four months later. So you can imagine this poor guy couldn't sit, couldn't stand, could barely lay down. He's miserable, immobilizing, but he waited it out. Presumably he didn't have functional numbness or weakness and no risk factors like cauda equina syndrome or bowel or bladder dysfunction or any of this other stuff. So he, he was safe to wait and he waited it out and he did have to wait four months, but then it went away, which is an important thing to realize. I was super active and I was running, I was playing sports, I had no issues, I had no pain. A year later, I don't exactly know what I did, but the same thing happened and it caused the same pain to come back. I went through a two-month chiropractic recovery plan that included massages and physiotherapy and it didn't really help. Yeah, so the problem was a herniated disc. That's how you got better the first time because they normally heal on their own. Chiropractic care doesn't, it's good, it's good to have a doctor with you and the moist packs and the comfort and the rest, but chiropractic treatment, chiropractic manipulation doesn't do anything for a herniated disc. It does a lot for joint problems in the spine. It does a lot, a lot for joint problems to mobilize them. But a herniated disc, the only one who can heal that is you. And the only way you can heal that is through your body. So it didn't do anything, but it wasn't expected to. And physical therapy, the same thing. Um, I'm now three months out of that flare up. I have, ha I have very slight pain. I can still feel some nerve pain in my hamstring and my glute. Sometimes it goes down to my foot, but it's very rare. I can work out, I can, I can work out but I don't push myself I can't because I'm scared. I don't trust my back yet. The neurosurgeon's office has set up a surgery date for me this next week. I'm hesitant to do the surgery because I've seen a lot of negative comments about it. That the pain comes back, uh, didn't go away, is worse. Right now, the pain is not that bad. I'm scared that I might come back from this thing potentially worse than before. It's going to take time. What do you suggest? Should I do the surgery? No. Well, uh, I assume the surgery is microdiscectomy, and if you, the reason to have microdiscectomy surgery for a herniated disc is that you are going to speed up the time frame of the recovery. So instead of taking two years, we're going to get all the recovery down in one day by getting out those disc fragments. If you're getting better on your own, there's no need to speed up the recovery. You're getting better. You're, you know, your, your recovery is already speedy. You're, you're on a speeding train. You don't need to go any faster. Microdiscectomy surgery is not going to change your long-term outcome according to the NIH-sponsored SPORT trial. And that's a really important study. Sometimes studies are so small or so meaningless that they really don't help us understand what to do. But that was a really good one that, that did help. That In that study, which NIH means the National Institutes of Health, so the government sponsored it. In that study, they looked at, the guy came in just like you. He's got a herniated disc, flip a coin, surgery. Next, Anthony, that was Anthony P. Now we got Anthony Q. Very similar guy, same problem, but next guy, flip a coin, no surgery. Then they compared the two, and over two years, the two groups were the same. It doesn't mean the surgery didn't do anything. It did. It helped people get better faster. But the message is you get better anyway. So no, I disagree with the uh, recommendation for surgery based on the information that I have so far. If I were the surgeon, I would cancel the surgery. And I really think you need to talk to your surgeon, Anthony P, and make sure that, that they want to go ahead. If they do, despite understanding that you are recovered and they don't explain this to you differently, maybe there's something else going on, I don't know, but if they don't have a different explanation, then I would go get a second opinion and uh, make sure that, you know, everybody's different. Every case is unique. The surgeon 
isn't answering in general and he's got better information than I have, but so he's a, probably in a better position, he's in a better position than me, but this doesn't make sense based on the way you're explaining it. So we need to get a better explanation. Does that make sense? Good. All right. Oh, question in the chat. Yay, thank you for coming to the chat. Hello, Sailor Cloud, uh, ASMR. I have a herniation causing severe spinal stenosis, but I'm not in pain. Mm, that's really interesting. I have limited range of motion. A yearly MRI shows no change in the herniation, and the doctor recommends surgery, but it seems unnecessary. Ah, now this is a very interesting question. This comes up once in a while. First of all, you're fascinating, which is what you never want to be, which is an interesting case to a doctor. Some people have severe stenosis and they're in agonizing pain. Then the next person comes in like you and they have severe stenosis and they're in no pain. Obviously, the difference is the amount of inflammation going on on the nerve root. But the question is, how come you didn't have an inflamed nerve root, but the other guy did? and we just don't really know. Then the question comes, okay, so normally the pain would be unbearable and the pain would be the reason you had the surgery. Well now, for whatever reason, take the pain off the table. Is severe stenosis dangerous in and of itself? And you could argue that both ways. You could say on the one hand, no, he's not in pain. He's doing fine. He's not weak or numb. Everything's moving along okay. I'm a little concerned about you because you said, you have limited range of motion. But, but it sounds like the strength is good. So one argument would be, yeah, he's doing fine right now. There's really no reason to do anything. The other argument would be, yeah, but what if he is losing strength, but so slowly he's not aware of it? And he's putting himself in a dangerous situation. He's got severe stenosis. If something else happens, if a little more disc herniation occurs, then he's likely to get worse, and we could prevent that by going in there and taking out this herniated disc and moving on from there. So it's definitely, which is true, both are true. And in my mind, if you asked for my opinion, which you have, I would say it really depends on, are you really okay? You're telling me that you can't, you have limited range of motion. Well, if you can't move, that's your body telling you more discs could easily come out. That means you're in danger. And to me, that would be a good reason to get decompressed and have surgery. So I would say it depends on exactly how you're doing and exactly what your MRI looks like. But I believe personally, severe stenosis over a long period of time is dangerous. It's just not healthy. It limits you and what you can do. The risks of surgery are very low. And so I would probably favor moving on and having surgery. If you don't wanna move on and have surgery, you have to ask yourself, well, can I really live with that decision? Can I really be this age and not have range of motion? That's not normal. What's that gonna to do to the rest of your body? Am I putting myself at risk and that's affecting me psychologically? Am I constantly anxious? I can tell my body knows something's wrong. Am I, am I exposing myself to more stress than is necessary? You don't wanna have unnecessary surgery, but you also, um, you also don't wanna put off surgery that could really help you. I find sometimes, and I don't know if this is your situation or not, but let me just throw this out there and we'll see if it sticks like spaghetti on the wall. I find sometimes when people don't trust their doctor, their surgeon in their heart, they just get stuck. And on the one hand, their head tells them, I think I need to have surgery. But on the other hand, their heart tells them, I don't trust this guy or I don't trust this person. And so what do you do? You're not going, having surgery puts you under somebody's knife who you don't trust that monkey with the knife? No. So it's a good idea sometimes in a situation like this to get a second opinion, to go in and see another surgeon who you trust, who you uh, do your research on, make sure they're a five-star surgeon, 
They did a fellowship if they're an orthopedic surgeon or they're a neurosurgeon. They have high ratings in the community online. They practice minimally invasive surgery. They are experienced and board certified and properly trained. And if all that good stuff is there, then you're probably in pretty good shape. Might want to think about getting a second opinion. All right, can spinal decompression session... Oh, more questions on the thing. Okay, very good. Um, Katie Girl, I was offered a hemming laminectomy, but I don't trust because I need a trusted surgeon. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. So hemming laminectomy in the lumbar spine, Katie Girl, is an operation called microdiscectomy. That's that same operation. And um, on the one hand, I think, you know, you got to realize sometimes, why don't you trust the surgeon? Is that on you? Are you just not trusting in general? If you are not, if you are kind of a trusting person and that's not an issue for you, then what is it about this surgeon? Because maybe your gut is exactly right and you need to see somebody else. The biggest time this becomes a problem is when you live in a small town. If you live in, a, if you live in Phoenix, you know, one of the largest cities in the country, there's dozens of surgeons who are good and who could do this surgery. But sometimes you live in a small town, there's only one or even none. And so in that case, it's best to get out of town and get evaluated by somebody, get to somebody you trust. It's very important to figure out in your own mind, what would make me trust the surgeon? Do I want a surgeon who's young and has the most current training? Or do I, would I trust more a surgeon who's older and more experienced? Would I trust a surgeon who advertises on the internet? Or would I trust a surgeon who has a really good reputation in my community and I know somebody who treated them? Those You gotta kinda think about what, what would that surgeon look like and then find them. And if you can't find them, come to us and we'll, we'll, help, we'll be happy to help you find them. Uh, Sailor Cloud, ASMR, thank you so much for your insight. I'm 30. I feel best standing straight and lying flat, but I can't bend forward much. I wasn't aware of the hidden issues of avoiding surgery. Oh yeah. Um, listen, by the way, look, you're 30 years old. I mean, my, I have a 30-year-old kid. Like, to me, that's young. And I, you can't live like that. You should not be having to control your posture based around a disc herniation that's been going on for quite some time. So you really need surgery. Um, interestingly, there was a study done fairly recently where they looked at spinal stenosis and the decisions for treatment. And people who do not have surgery have a 36% increased chance of death over the next two years. Of death. Yeah, actually just did a video about this. It'll be released pretty soon. I mean, that's scary stuff. That's probably not you. Th those are probably the spinal stenosis people who are old. You're not gonna die from this, you know, thank God. But, but it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. But not being able to bend forward when you're 30 years old, come on, man. That's not what life's about. You gotta get out there and get it done. And uh, I think if you don't trust your surgeon, find another one who's going to take good care of you and, and get you fixed up. All right. Um, can spinal decompression sessions done at physical therapy help with a herniated disc? No, they can't. So spinal decompression is traction. And traction is an incredibly good treatment for a condition, but that condition is not herniated disc. Spinal traction, this is a, a spine, this is somebody from the front, and here are the discs. And a herniated disc is where one comes out and inflames a nerve root. We keep going around to the back of the spine. We get the facet joints. Arthritis of a facet joint, very painful condition, that is helped enormously by traction because the traction pulls the joint apart and takes the pressure off the painful thing, and that feels so much better. But a herniated disc, you can't pull it apart. It doesn't suck back in. That's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like that. So um, uh, decompression therapy done at physical therapy does not help with a herniated disc. That is not logical or sensible, but it helps a ton with facet arthropathy, with facet arthritis. How many discs can be done? This is in response to the neck fusion versus artificial disc study. It looks like I have three possible four discs that need to be replaced. 
C345 at least. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. How many discs can be done? And the answer is there is no actual limit, but the more levels that are done, the higher the risk of having adjacent level problems. And so what a lot of doctors have come down to is if they need to do more, let's say you need to do four levels, we'll do three levels of fusion and an artificial disc to maintain, to try to break up the long fusion segment. So a lot of people are using artificial discs in combination with fusion when there are multiple levels to try to make it better. But the actual limit, there is no actual limit. It's just as you get more levels, you take on more risk. All right, next question. Um, I understand that sacral issues, torsion and disc issues in terms of symptoms often overlap. Yes, they do. Do you think that my glute pain when sitting, specifically back pain, is attributable to my sacrum or my stenosis? I've been diagnosed with mild bilateral foraminal stenosis. I feel a sense of instability when I'm standing. No, no, no. Pain with sitting um, and walking downstairs is classic sacroiliac pain. So that's almost certainly, it's also, by the way, discogenic pain. But foraminal stenosis is nerve root pain. That's a shooting pain, not usually back, more usually leg and it's aggravated by lateral bending, by bending to the side. So based on what you're telling me, it's much more likely that it's the sacroiliac issue and not the foraminal stenosis. There is a way to know for sure, and that's to in, have an injection to block one or the other. So if they did an injection into your sacroiliac joint, it's temporary, but if you said, oh my God, thanks doc, I feel like a new man or a new person, I'm done. Um, well, the pain's going to all come back after the numbing wears off. But if that was a sacroiliac injection, then it was not your foraminal stenosis that hurt. Conversely, if they did a transforaminal epidural injection and you got temporary relief, it's more likely that it's just the nerve root and not the sacroiliac joint. Does that make sense? I hope so. I have new OA, osteoarthritis, level two. Should I do visco first or PRP? Laura Lee Farajado, I think I answered this question. I could be wrong. Uh, so there's four levels of uh, X-ray severity of arthritis. Zero is absolutely none. One is slight. Two is you're starting to have loss of uh, joints, joint space height, as well as some deformity of the joint, but not much. And then it goes on and on from there. So level three is uh, a no-brainer for injection. Level four, usually you're looking at joint replacement. So we're talking, we're at level two. So we're on a relatively low level. Um, and Laura Lee's thinking about having an injection. So then she says, well, should I have hyaluronic acid or PRP? And the answer is, um, the answer is, it depends on how old you are. If you're over 30, the amount of growth factor in your body is rare, is really low already. So PRP, where the growth factors are harvested from your own blood platelets, doesn't make sense. If you're over 30, game over, I would not have a PRP injection. Now, if you're over 30, and you want to go the regenerative route, an alternative to PRP would be to have a stem cell amnion-derived growth factor injection. And that would be an interesting thing to do because that actually has pretty darn good uh, anecdotal results. And there's at least one trial which did show some benefit from Mayo. So growth factor injection would be something to consider. Hyaluronic acid injection is a really different animal, what she calls visco. Hyaluronic acid injection, first of all, it's covered by insurance. So it's generally not as expensive for most people to get. Second of all, it's much more, um, it's much more researched. A lot more is known about it. It's still hit or miss. You're definitely gonna encounter people who did it and didn't get any benefit. The thing about you is you're, you're only level two, you're only great Kellerman Lawrence grade two on your x-ray. It's relatively low grade. I would try to get, in my mind, and there's no solid evidence on this, but my advice would be, hey, you, um, you should try to get this thing. First of all, definitely have physical therapy because you wanna make sure if you're using your knee in some way that could be improved, um, that's number one. Number two, I mean, this is, 
you know, you don't need me to tell you this, but I don't know what your weight is like, but weight is a huge issue. What's likely to determine whether you go on to get worse arthritis or it gets better is if you is how much weight you're carrying. If you're carrying extra weight and you want to help your knee, really important to consider doing something about that. Like that helps, right? I mean, I'm I'm in the same boat as you. It's very hard to lose weight and keep it off forever. But in an ideal world, that would be something to consider. And then the last thing is um, kind of just your own take on it. Like, do you want to try something new and off-label, or do you want to try something that has been around? And then the last thing I want you to consider, and this is actually super important, is these are not mutually exclusive. You can do both. So you could try one, and if it doesn't work, try the other. And that, that may be the best way to go. Well, we're almost out of time. I'm going to try to get in one more question. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't quite get to the end. Hello. I had surgery about seven months ago. This is uh, knee surgery. Venicular bone with a plate. It still hurts to walk after all. It feels kind of numb. Is there any massage or something that I could do to get better for the next morning? Uh, a plate. It still hurts to walk after all day. It feels kind of numb. Um, is there anything I could do that will help me for the next morning? I mean, this is often, it sounds like you're building up inflammation around the operative site as a result of use of the limb, use of the knee. And one, one thing that people often consider in this situation is prophylactic anti-inflammatories. Like if you're going to be really active, maybe you pop a couple of a leave at the time of the activity to, to try to get you through. This is, of course, assuming that NSAIDs are safe for your body and you don't have heart problems and you know, all the other things that go with that. All right, look, I got one minute and I'm uh, going to try to get through my last question. Hi, Doc. Hi, Giancario Fernandini. I'm having low back pain and it's possible herniated disc. My back is cracking like every five to 10 minutes. I need it for it to crack to feel good. I sit in a chair. Would this be a normal thing? I'm a little bit worried. Um, back cracking is not a herniated disc. What's cracking is the joints of the low back. And it sounds like what you have is an inflamed facet joint. And the best way you can deal with that is through moist heat, anti-inflammatory medications or muscle relaxants if they're safe for your body, as well in the long term with core strengthening through light activity. Yoga is very helpful for this, better than cracking your back all the time. Also Pilates, also um, Tai Chi. So those are my uh, suggestions to you. Well, we're right out of time. Guys, thanks so much for being with me. Uh, I hope you got hope and got what you needed. For those of you who came on, thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you soon. Please join me next week and uh, submit your questions. Try that video ask. It's very cool, very easy to do, and I can, I can give you a better answer if I get a better question. Have a great day and a great week. Take care of yourself, and I'll see you soon. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, Click the link to our website and complete the submission form. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health.